putting this day together. It's been fantastic. I learned so much. It's been very interesting. And I'm afraid that I'm going to be a bit of a wet blanket on the day. So, because I'm going to just do some pure philosophy. Everybody else has had lots of fascinating empirical data. I'm just going to do some straight philosophical analysis. I don't know if that's what Jonathan had in mind when he invited me. No, I because I've been, I've written a lot about improved to orientated stuff about animal minds and about the relative uh, roles of conscious control and automatic systems in the control of behavior, but I'm not going to do any of that. It's just going to be a straight philosophy. Even worse, I'm going to argue that, that uh, today would have been better off without raising the term consciousness at all. <laughs> so, so Jonathan started off saying, "Look, it's really good. We, we, we want to be really interested in, in phenomenal consciousness and in particular where phenomenal consciousness is located outside the human realm in the animal animal world." Um, maybe these are good questions. Uh, I, I'm going to kind of leave that open. What I want to try and argue is that uh, they aren't questions that are helpful to science. The science that we've been doing today would be done much better, if you ask me, without muddying it up with difficult questions about where's the line between the conscious and the sentient and the non-conscious and the non-sentient. So that's what I'm going to argue. I wonder if I can make this bigger so I don't have to turn to the screen all the time. Let's see what I'm saying. That's That's good. Good. Now, I should say, so does science need conscious? Science is going to be going to be known. I should say I haven't always thought this. I mean, I've, I've, I've written an awful lot about not just about animal minds and uh, control of action, but a lot more about how to fit consciousness into the, the natural material world, what's its role in the scheme of things, and uh, uh, I've it's pretty enthusiastic for the, the, the scientific enterprise of, of uh, figuring out where consciousness was and where it wasn't. But I was trying to persuade, I was at a conference in a few years ago, five million, I remember, trying to persuade a bunch of neuroscientists about the interest of thinking about consciousness. And, and they said, no, no, well, why do we have to do that? We're just going to study what's going on in, in the brain. And I said, no, there's all these very interesting Things you can find out if you if you want to study consciousness. For, for instance, you might find out that that uh, I refer to the Tishner illusion and how when you grab, you want your hand isn't fooled by the Tishner illusion. You still have a narrow, narrow grip. And I said, isn't, isn't it interesting that the information that's guiding your hand is not conscious? I mean, and that's what's interesting here. I mean, that, that it's not conscious. And then I talked about uh, even the pain you you get the morphine after the pain. They report that it doesn't hurt anymore, but the pain's still there. And I, and I say, isn't it interesting that, 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 that the state which is no longer worrying them is still conscious? You might have expected that it would have been deleted from consciousness. And, uh, aren't these interesting findings? And they said, yes, yes, that's very, very interesting, but why do you need to talk about consciousness in order to bring out the interest? Isn't the interesting thing that the, the information guiding your hand is not accessible and prospectively that the subject can't report on this information. They'll ask the subject to report on the original information, they'll say that the, the circle's much bigger than the hand. So, and conversely, isn't it interesting that even after the morphine and the pain ceases to worry the patients, they can still report the presence of the pain, maybe the location of the pain in their body. So they said, no, no, we're, we're, we're very interested in those kind of findings, but that's all to do with, with internal neural, neural goings on and what the subjects can introspectively report. And we don't have to bring in consciousness to, to identify those claims. So, and that was a bit of an epiphany for me. I, I, the more I thought, the more I thought, well, it's not clear to me that anything scientifically useful is, is added by raising questions of consciousness. So, we need to be more specific here. This, this example has, uh, has uh, 
uh, no doubt remind a lot of you of Ned Block's distinction between between what he calls access consciousness and, and phenomenal consciousness. So access consciousness, the state is access conscious, if, and this can be defined functionally, if, if the organism is a subject, is capable of introspectively identifying its presence and maybe reporting it, and I mean, we can, we can fuss about the, the exactly appropriate definition of access consciousness, but it's a basic, straightforwardly, functionally definable Definable notion. If we identify the access conscious states in terms of what kinds of effects they have, and particularly do they have effects on the subject's uh, uh, beliefs about what's going on. But Bloch was, was very keen to distinguish access consciousness from phenomenal consciousness. And phenomenal consciousness, he says, is well, that's to do with, with uh, uh, Thomas Nagel's idea of its being like something. And uh, as Jonathan put it this morning, it's, it's the states that are, that are like something. And, and Ned <coughs> wanted to say, look, these, these aren't the same, the same notion, at least at first pass, kind of conceptually, we can easily imagine beings that are full of access conscious states, but for whom there's nothing that's like. So <coughs> Philosophical zombies, I'm going to come back to philosophical zombies, but, but, but uh, a, a being who's physically like me, or, or maybe a robot who's structured, structured like me, I was asking about robots, uh, uh, but there's no, there's no feelings inside. So we can imagine access consciousness without, not, we, can, we can imagine phenomenal consciousness without access consciousness. If we imagine that, that, that bees, or indeed plants, or indeed rats, or cats, are are phenomenally conscious, presumably they're not access conscious, they're, they're not in the business of thinking about their own mental states or reporting them. So the two, the two notions are clearly, clearly different. Now, so we've got two notions here. Science, science is, is very much concerned with the functional organization of the brain, so it's certainly be interested in, in uh, matters of access consciousness. Does it need to be interested in matters of phenomenal consciousness? Well, let's think about what these two notions have to do with each other. So, Ned Brock in the first instance just wanted to say these were two different ideas, two different concepts. He didn't want to argue at that stage that they necessarily referred to different things. It's perfectly possible, as he thought, that the, the states are phenomenally conscious were one and the same as the states that were access conscious. We just have two different ways of picking up the same, same category. So it would be like the concept water and the concept H2O. They're kind of, they're not the same concept. And what's more, you can, you can imagine something being water. But imagine you know a bit of chemistry, you've got the concept H2O, and you've got the concept water, but you haven't actually done, done that bit of chemistry. So you can imagine that water is not H2O. You can imagine that H2O, I mean, you know what H2O is made, you can imagine that that was kind of yellow and sweaty. I mean, uh, so the two concepts are not the same concept. As it happens, we know they refer to the same thing. These are just two different things. It's like two names for the same person. Two, two concepts pick up the same thing. And it may be like that with access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. Indeed, I'll come back to this. I mean, that's, that's one standard theory of what phenomenal consciousness is. Some people won't identify with access consciousness. But once we recognize that these are different concepts, it's then an open empirical question to be settled by, by research whether phenomenal consciousness refers to the same thing as access consciousness. Okay. So, Let's focus on the question, we've got the concept of phenomenal consciousness. We've got this concept, we've been talking about it. In fact, a lot of the time today we didn't talk about it, and if you ask me that, it was good, but it did come out now and then. And, uh, uh, and the question is, what does that concept refer to? The concept of, it's being like something for uh, the, the lights being, it's, uh, it's empty, they're, they're, having, they're having conscious experiences. Uh, so, what does it refer to? Well, one, one possible view is that it refers to some non-material 
uh, dualist, dualist state. Think of Descartes, you had a physical norm, and you had a separate mental norm, and uh, they, were, they were distinct. And so quite a lot of people do want to argue from the dissociability at the conceptual level of the concept of phenomenal consciousness with access consciousness or anything else scientific, that phenomenal consciousness refers to something uh, non-material. So, so we've got the physical realm. Uh, uh, perhaps I should say a bit more about materialism and non-materialism, since it's been a feature pretty central here. So the materialist view is that uh, there's nothing in reality that isn't physical, or maybe some complicated machinery made of physical things. Be quite open to uh, what that involves. Saul so Kripke has a nice, a nice metaphor. He says that if you're a materialist, imagine God making the universe. I right? mean, he, he starts off, he, he, he puts all the puts all the matter in place, but also all the molecules and all the, the force fields and so on, and so on there. Now ask yourself, is his work done? Kripke said, if you're a materialist, the answer is yes. Well, no, no. He's, he's, he's put everything there. What's more, what he's put? No. No. All the lines there, too. You can't, you can't, if you're a materialist, then you can put all the material stuff there and leave anything out. If you're non materialist, then you'll say, no, God's work isn't done. He has to add in the feelings and other non-material stuff. So, that's the materialist view. That there isn't anything in reality that isn't physical stuff or complicated kind of uh, systems made of physical stuff. The dualist view is that there's something extra outside the physical realm, outside the material realm. Our, our, our minds and they can, well, and now, now what can they do? It's an interesting question. The trouble with materialism is you face an awkward dilemma, both of which came up in Chris's talk. One side of the dilemma is that you can be a phenomenalist. You can say that there's all the, the physical stuff that kind of takes care of itself, and every so often it shoots off puffs of smoke. Very good, very good uh, metaphor. Which are the conscious feelings, but they don't make any difference to the proceeding of the train. Now, I think Chris said nobody wants to be a phenomenalist. You're, you're quite right. It's completely, completely unsustainable view. Uh, in, in, in my circles, there were two philosophers, two conventional philosophers, who were very attracted by dualism about Sorry, 30 you, years ago. Can I briefly interrupt? Sorry, just yeah, sure. stop me if I can. Yeah. Why is because something is uh, uh, intellectually or, or emotionally unpalatable? Why is that? Unsustainable. I mean, it's, no, 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 no. I would quite, I mean, you know, okay, I mean, yeah, that's fine. I would quite like to jump, jump out there, but gravity is an unsustainable concept because it, that, that wasn't supposed to be a replacement for an yeah. argument. That was just supposed to be a, a gesture at the argument. So the arguments are, are, are fine. Are fine. Okay. So David Chalmers and Frank Jackson were both persuaded 30 years ago uh, by various authors who went into that you have to be a dualist. The concept of phenomenal consciousness refers to something non physical. And at that point, they both said, well, we're going to be empty phenomenalists. And the more they thought, this is again arguing from authority, but I could fill in the arguments in just no time. <laughs> both of them have given up on empty phenomenalists, and they realize it just, it's hopeless. Look, here's, here's the worst bit of it. Uh, if you're an empty phenomenalist, and the feelings don't make any difference to what goes on in the physical world, then they don't make any difference to what's going on in your brain, in particular, what you think and what you say. So, if you're persuaded by what's going on in you that dualism is true, that can't be because dualism is true, because the dualist facts can't make any difference to what's going on in your brain. So, so even if dualism was false, it was just the physical world, the physical guys would still be saying dualism is true for the same reason. I mean, that's, it's, it's a mess. I mean, even if, even if dualism were true, it wouldn't persuade you that dualism is true on every view. Every is, it, it really is. Yeah. You can stick with it if you like, but it's, it's not. <laughs> the alternative is to be an interactive dualist. And I said both these options came up in Chris's talk. And Chris might not have realized, but you committed yourself 
to interactive dualism. You said, you said, I'm going to quote, <laughs> you said, we can do something that philosophical zombies can't do. Philosophical zombies are supposed to be beings who are physically identical to me. So there's a being who's got all the physics that I've got, and here's me. And if you think I can do something that that being can't do, that must be because you think there's some extra stuff coming down and fiddling in my brain. So, so I don't think you want to think that. So, uh, so that's what, that's what Eccles used to think. That's, that's what Karl Popper used to think, that, that in addition to the standard uh, electrochemical forces that, that make a difference in the brain, there were extra special mental forces, nervous force fields, came down and did things that the physical forces can't do. It's a coherent position, totally coherent, but I suspect one that few people here would like to confess to. Okay, so... So put those options to one side. We can go that. I mean, I, I'm not trying to argue uh, by, by rhetoric or authority. There's no need to discuss here. But let's take it for the sake of the argument that epiphenomenalism and interactive dualism are not positions we want to endorse. So there's a materialist option. And that is to say that our concept of phenomenal consciousness actually refers to some physically respectable state. So, it might refer to access consciousness, it might refer to introspectively accessible. You might say that the, the states that feel like something, like something to be in are just one and the same as the states that can be introspectively accessed. Pretty standard view that's a, a higher order theory of consciousness. Uh, you can come, I'm going to come back and discuss it again. Or, you no, know, there's lots of options here. You might say the states that are like something, that are phenomenally conscious, are the states that involve integrated information. Uh, 40 hertz oscillations. Friedman clock. You might think that the states that involve suprapersonal control, that's a reference to, to Chris, that the, involve coordination suprapersonal between different people. <coughs> you might think they're the states that involve unrestricted associative learning. You might think that the states that involve flexible behavior. And I'm allowing your behavior to be influenced by your valuations. Well, I said some stuff like that. Chris mentioned at lunchtime that the C. elegans, the males, have 23 extra neurons that allow them to weigh up the relative attractions of sex and food at certain points in their life. You might think that as soon as you've got that kind of value-based flexible behavior, you've got, you've got phenomenal consciousness. You might push it even further down. You might think as soon as you have a distinction between Reafferents and ex knowing the difference between the world impinging on your body and changes that are due to your, your own movements, then you'll have some kind of phenomenal consciousness. These are, all, these are all serious options. Okay, so given all these options, you might wonder how are we going to choose between them? So, Well, what's the methodology we use? Well, in the, in the first instance, it doesn't really apply to what we've been talking about today. Today it was all about the problem that is left unanswered by the standard methodology. But the standard methodology is to fiddle with human beings in certain ways, stimulate them in certain ways, slash words at them very fast, put a mask there afterwards, uh, 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 <coughs> give them morphine. You can do all kinds of things. You hope you have some idea about what's going on in their brain after they've done that. And then you ask them, were you conscious of that? Uh, did you see the word being flashed up? Uh, did you not see it being flashed up? And by and large, we say, well, if they say, yes, uh, I, I, I noticed it happening, then it's conscious. And if they say, no, I didn't notice anything, then whatever went on in their brain is not conscious. Perfectly standard standard methodology, and uh, uh, that's the one we use when we're dealing with human subjects, and we don't really think, think twice about it. In the case of human subjects, we're very happy to assume that if they say, yes, I noticed it, then that was a conscious state, and if they uh, say, no, I didn't, then kind of paradigm of what it is to be not, not conscious. But of course, that methodology might 
help us to draw a nice line in humans between the conscious states and the unconscious ones, sometimes surprising. So the, the morphine pain is conscious, the, the dorsal screen visual information is not conscious, very surprising, very interesting, so it works fine with humans. But what's going to happen when we turn to other animals? Of course, with other animals, there's no, there's no obvious way. I know Nick and Clarence has tried to, tried to finesse this problem. There's no obvious way of asking them. Now, with Newton, you can get a monkey and you can do all kinds of things, and flash things, and, and, and then and it, might, it might do various things in response to various behaviors. And then you say, and now was it conscious? Well, you're in the dark. No, not necessarily. Okay, I think no, because for example, if you, if, I don't think it has been done, or maybe maybe before, but I'm not aware of it. But you can do masking experiments with monkeys, in theory, and you can uh, and and see if they have learned. If they have learned, uh, uh, and uh, you know, present them with a kind of do similar experiments that people have done on, uh, on animals. Then it hasn't been done, as far as I know. Some people, but think. it is possible. But, you can give them no, the even, even, even that's not so you can give that it to even that, that's not going to, going to work. A, I mean, A, uh, there's, well, A, there's a question which you're assuming that, that associative learning per se, uh, a special system, kind of, I mean, not anything, not constitutes anything. a kind of consciousness, which, which is what's up for grabs at the moment. But B, there was a question I asked you, which I still don't feel quite really satisfactory. Answered that in us, there's certain kinds of associative learning that fail the test. Uh, that we had on the previous page, that, that people say, no, no, I wasn't aware of, of detecting the edges. Of, um, where did we go to? Uh, so, so the fact that the monkeys are learning, I mean, in, in, in the context I'm arguing now, uh, isn't going to decide they're, they're conscious. They might be doing unconscious learning, as indeed we often do ourselves in many cases. Okay. So do you know what happens when you give a mirror to a, to a chimpanzee? If you give a mirror, yeah. do you know what happens? I mean, they recognize themselves sometimes with a thing on their head. It takes yes. a while. They, they don't, they don't think that uh, is a representation of, of them in their head? I'm not inclined to say chimpanzees are conscious, but uh, uh, if somebody was inclined to say that, I don't think they'd be persuaded by that. I mean, chimpanzees... Uh, Chimpanzees is to do quite a lot of complicated behavioral things. That's not that's not in question, including finding out things about themselves by looking in a mirror. Why does that decide anything? Look, so my view is I'm not going to query that humans are conscious. I'm not going to query that chimpanzees are conscious. I just don't think these are particularly helpful questions to science, especially when we get down to the the where should we go to? To the what's a dumb mammal? When did there aren't any dumb mammals? Uh, they, 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 <laughs> let's, let's get down to platypus, right? <laughs> animals that <laughs> sit on their food. Uh, platypuses, crabs, uh, 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 insects, worms. At this point, it doesn't seem to me a good idea to start asking whether they're conscious. But uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, not, I'm, I'm not ruling out that these are serious questions. All I'm saying is they're not going to make a difference to science. And I'm, I'm just building up to that. So, so far, I've just said the methodology we use for humans is going to run into trouble when we get to animals. And that's, I've taken up attention to. We can't use this methodology of asking these subjects whether they were conscious or not, which is the one that we use without thinking about it in the case of humans. Now, so what, what the standard idea is, is that we'll figure out, in the case of humans, what constitutes consciousness, and then we'll just extrapolate that to, to animals. But the, everybody's looking puzzled about that. Yeah, that's, that's the standard methodology for studying consciousness, uh, to try and find out 40 hertz in humans, whatever it was, uh, global workspace, so and so on. And, and the idea is that's supposed to project on. The animals. But of course, this doesn't work very straightforwardly because suppose you can draw a line around the, the, the cerebral processes which humans report, yes, that's conscious, and outside the line, it's not. That category is likely to share many, many properties. Uh, for a start, you might wonder well, should I be looking at 
the very low level properties, the chemical constitution. <coughs> People who watch Star Trek know that Commander Data shares uh, our functional organization down to a very fine level of detail, but not our chemical constitution. Is, is commanded with, we know that if us, for their functional organization and the chemical organization, they go hand in hand, that constitutes consciousness. Which one should we apply to command the data? Studying humans is an attendee. If you know the functional organization, it's a question about what scale of functional organization you care about. As, as uh, Bob pointed out this morning, it wouldn't be a good idea to uh, infer from the fact that, that crustaceans and other arthropods have very different uh, uh, components in their functional organization that they don't share enough functional organization with us to be conscious. So looking at the category which in humans we've identified using the standard test for consciousness isn't really going to tell us how to project. There's another way, which is not so much to do with uh, level of abstraction from the basic physical details, but up the level of, of causal structure. But the question of whether we build the reportability into the set. So there's a standard philosophical theory of consciousness, which is that a state is conscious in virtue of the fact that you can report it. So a state is conscious, if and only if we have some higher order state that's about that first order state, higher order theory of consciousness. Now, that's one view, which will, which will fit the category C very well. But you might say, no, I don't want to have the higher order theory. I want to have the thing that's being reported on, being constitutionally conscious. So that's another, another uh, dimension of indeterminacy not decided by the standard, by the standard methodology. I guess most people would want to say, look, we don't want to build higher order reportability into into the notion of phenomenal consciousness for the reason that's uh, been coming up. That's already going to rule out animals as conscious. It's going to rule out uh, 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 young infants as conscious. Uh, and surely we don't want to do that. Maybe that's right. Uh, but then that brings further worries in. If you're going to allow that a state can be conscious, even though the subject in which the state is taking place, has no higher order state representing it or allowing it to report on it, well then it's not quite clear why we shouldn't admit anything. I mean, think about, think about my early visual processing. We rule that out as conscious on the grounds that I couldn't report it. But if we now say reportability is not an necessary condition of consciousness, it's not quite clear why my early visual processing doesn't come out as conscious. I mean, it looks on either's criteria that it will. Uh, 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 maybe we, 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 My criterion is more demanding. Okay. <laughs> no, but I, well, your criterion was UAL, and it looks to me like early vision will do UAL all right. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can talk about that some more. So you might want to say, look, reportability is not an expression of consciousness, but then, as I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not against. I, I, I have no. no uh, uh, Dobby and the spiders, they say. I'm not against saying uh, any kind of associative learning uh, constitutes consciousness. But why stop there? Why not go on down to, to what were the other options I had on the last slide? Uh, uh, just any kind of flexible behavior, even if it's not a result of learning. Uh, what about uh, any awareness of this to your body and the external world? It's not quite clear what the rules of the game are. Okay, let's turn to today's question. It looks like a good question, right? Uh, why did consciousness evolve? What, what's, 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 the, what's the evolutionary role, what's the biological role of consciousness? And certainly it looks like in order to raise that question, we should uh, need a notion of, of phenomenal, phenomenal consciousness. I'm not so sure. Suppose, for the sake of the argument, this is kind of what I'm casting doubt on, but suppose we had figured out exactly what was uh, constituted consciousness. Suppose, suppose we agreed with Eva. I mean, I, I really like your theory, I'm going to come back to that. But suppose, suppose we did agree 
with you that the interesting thing here, what we're going to identify consciousness with, is unrestricted associative work. Okay, well, now we might wonder uh, why did UAL evolve? And a uh, very interesting question. And uh, in this case, it's not too hard to answer. But we're going to, and I'm going to come back to this, but, but both Bjorn and your talks made me terribly excited about UAL and, and, and uh, its relation to the Cambrian explosion. So that's, that's all good. But we could discuss all that without bringing in the question of consciousness at all. So here's B, which at the moment is UAL, and here's a thesis, very good thesis, I mean, I'm not especially worried about it, that that's one of the same as consciousness. And then there's understanding that the biological evolutionary role, evolutionary role of UAL, and it looks like these two, two projects just factor out completely. You might be interested in trying to locate the goings on that you want to identify with consciousness, but it's not clear that adds anything to the scientific, scientific question of why did the bee you identified your conscious with evolve and what role does it play? It's essentially how all of science works. What? It? what? It's essentially how all of science always works. We try to answer a general question, figure out how can we solve it experimentally, and get bogged down in details. So, and then I'm, I'm, kind of come, I'm kind of coming to that. So, <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's nothing wrong with your first idea here. We've got this everyday notion of, of consciousness, and now we're looking around to find uh, what in the, the natural world that refers to, and now we've got a good scientific understanding, and we can throw away the everyday. I mean, take, take water. Right? We started with this rough idea of water. We discovered this. There's H2. Oh, there's, there's heavy water H3, no, is that right? And, 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 uh, uh, and the distinctions and so on, and now, now we don't really want to use the, the notion of water in science anymore. I, I actually think, if, if that's all that's going on, I wouldn't mind. That's, that's fine. I think there's something else going on there. Uh, Nancy, I don't think why should we be interested in the science of consciousness? I mean, consciousness is kind of central to us. I mean, surely if we're going to be interested in anything, we should be interested in that. I am worried that a lot of people's thinking about this, including mine, and I'm going to put to yours as well, is driven by a kind of implicit dualism. Go back to the materialism I had on the sentence. Right? All that's really there is physical stuff and compared to this. And then I invite you to believe that consciousness is, if it's anything, is just some part of that. And I fear that that's just a very difficult thing for people to believe. When you're told, look, uh, my, uh, my pain is just one and the same as my nociceptive, receptive uh, uh, neurons, maybe connected with various prefrontal things. That's all it is, the natural thought is. But hang on, why should that physical stuff feel like that? Why should it feel like anything? We want, to, we want to ask that question, very natural question. That question presupposes Jewish. Uh, the idea that, that there's a question about why does this physical stuff, as we often say, give rise to, yield, generally feelings. Chris said not all brain states lead to feelings. I'm fair that lead to is a Implicitly dualist term. Uh, if, if you were really thinking as a materialist, you wouldn't think the brain state yielded feelings or generated feelings or, or led to feelings. You said it was the feelings. The, the brain process and the feelings are one and the same thing. So I'm worried that people aren't concentrating hard enough on that idea. The brain process and the feelings are one and the same thing. And they, they're slipping into the idea that the consciousness, the phenomenal, is something over the dualist idea. Of course, if you've got the dualist idea, Maybe you think the dualist stuff actually has some effects in the physical world. Well, then it's a terribly exciting and important and crucial question. Uh, where, where does this dualist stuff arise? And I fear that's, that's kind of what, if people haven't analyzed it carefully enough, is driving a lot of the kind of debates that we're having today. 
So I'm just going to try and drive it home. I want to just look at a couple of, I mean, I think that what's going on with consciousness is not just what Bjorn said. We've got this everyday notion we're trying to find out what's going on in the natural world, but something a bit more insidious and suspicious. So let's compare it with, with life. And uh, so Ganti, am I pronouncing Ganti? Yeah, just, just, just like that. Uh, so he identified it with unlimited heredity and uh, uh, he argued that proto-solidarity is the precondition of that. So that's, that's, you know, that's, a, that's a, a definition of something. But you could imagine somebody saying, look, it's maybe something there. Maybe uh, viruses are alive. Some people think viruses are alive. You know. but can you imagine somebody saying, uh, maybe, maybe uh, eukaryosity is required. Maybe multicellularity is required for life. I mean, you imagine people saying, no, no, we could have a, a debate at this point. And say, no, no, which is which was the important important step for the big transition from non-life to life, and we, we can have that have that debate, and and maybe we'd end up agreeing with Gandhi. Maybe not. Maybe maybe we think, look, um, uh, it's only eukaryotes that are really interesting and give us any any possibility to continue. But, okay, imagine. Imagine the sign that say Gantley was wrong and uh, we went for big curiosity. Uh, we wouldn't think that apart from the question of which was the more significant transition, there was a further question about whether we got right the essence of life. Right? If you thought there was and he might be taught. Then you'd think, oh, has the definition managed to lock on to the extra thing? But if you don't think there's an extra thing, well then, it's not clear there's a big issue here. There's just which of the, the different uh, divisions among, among material things. Uh, what's kind of the most significant for kicking off, kicking off evolution? So I'm putting to you, you, we should worry about whether we're, we're thinking about consciousness in the way somebody might think about the definition of life if they believe in an extra non-material vital spirit. Let me go back to this. I, mean, I want to say that, <coughs> as I said, that, that until today I hadn't, I hadn't, I mean, I've always been interested in the social of learning. I kind of have. I mean, I asked Peter Godfrey Smith about instrumental conditioning in a talk about a month ago, and he was of the view that operant conditioning had evolved separately in various places, including among the cephalopods, sometime after the Cambrian explosion. That's what he, I mean, and, 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 that is not Ah, that's not what Bjorn thinks. Uh, anyway. Not of proper complex of representation, like the one that's the, the, okay. uh, the, the, model the based, model particular, model. particular uh, cephalopods, okay. not the. Uh, we can, we can get, we can get fine not tuned. Not Nautilus. We can, we can get fine tuned. We, 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 we can get fine tuned. Uh, so I'm terribly excited by the idea that, that associative learning, uh, okay, uh, uh, classical and simple opera conditioning kind of arrived with the Cambrian explosion. That's what drove the subsequent evolution. Very exciting. But still, imagine somebody saying, well, I've I, I got, all, I got all, all that, but I don't really see why learning should be important for consciousness. Because after all, after you've got learning, you've just got a certain uh, neural arrangements. And imagine a being that had just those same neural arrangements, uh, as it were, written into the genes without any, any shaping by learning. Wouldn't that be as much conscious? And you could imagine somebody disputing your definition of consciousness. What I want to put to you is that I can agree with you about the importance of UAL for evolution, for this hugely important transition, but maybe disagree with you about whether it's, it's the source of consciousness. And I don't see what 
adding in the question of whether that's consciousness or, or flexible behavior is consciousness is adding to the scientific debate. Here's one, one final analogy. I was thinking about memory. I was thinking about Bjorn's idea that don't we have an everyday notion and then we want to kind of figure out what's going on in, in scientific reality underpinning it. I said, well, take memory, okay? And there's the everyday notion of memory, right? And we start doing the science and we discover, what have I got? Uh, uh, many different yeah, and short term memory, long term memory, always one's on the board, right? And, and uh, it all, but, and the analogy is supposed to be, and we, and we discover there's uh, reactance versus exactance, and there's UAL, and there's uh, binding, and there's power of consciousness, and, and, and we start saying, which is the real consciousness? Which is phenomenal consciousness? And I'm worried that's like, that, that's like some people would say, well, I can see there are all these different processes in pain, but which is the real memory? Now, nobody would do that. Why? Because they don't think of memory involving something extra to whatever physical processes you... So now over here on the conscious, we find all these different physical processes. And prominent and scientists like, take one and say, this is the one. <laughs> but many prominent scientists, they take theirs and say, this is the real one. Well, exactly. But it's not a good idea. Right? <laughs> so... Uh, uh, so I'm saying it's a bad idea, once you've looked at all these different physical processes, to carry on fretting about which is really consciousness. This is our sign. This is our sign. Uh, we like saying which is really, which is really. <coughs> and now I, I didn't have a very ambitious. Okay, you might think, what does this leave? Where does this leave the philosophy of consciousness? Now, I, I don't want to rule out. I don't want to say this is the end of the debate. I don't want to rule out that, there's a, that, that there may be some way of giving substance to the question which of these physical processes is really consciousness. But all I wanted to show you today is I don't see that it helps to uh, further the scientific debate to bring that question in that only seems to me to muddy the water. I'm sorry to <laughs> <laughs> That's it.